Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our topics class. We're continuing on in our study of kingdom truth. The Lord Jesus taught about the kingdom. The kingdom is not something to be spiritualized. It's a literal, physical, political kingdom that will be set up here upon this earth at the return of Jesus. It'll last here on this earth for a thousand years before that dispensation comes to an end. And we are experiencing today a counterfeit kingdom masquerading as the true kingdom of God. And this is what we're going to be studying today. Please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. And in this chapter, Jesus gives the seven parables. And we're going to be dealing with the second one of those parables today, the, parables of the, the parable of the wheat and the tares. Uh, does everybody have a lesson sheet? We're on lesson number nine today. If you didn't get one, hold up your hand. We'll see that you did. Okay, well, let's have prayer and then look into the word. Heavenly Father, now we come once again in Jesus' precious name, and we thank you for the word of God. Lord, we believe it is to be taken literally. And Lord, we believe it is the very word of God rather than the word of men. And Lord, we pray that we might handle it as in truth it is the holy word breathed of God. Thank you, Lord, for this divine revelation. Help us to study it and rightly divide it that we may understand the truth thereof. So bless our study time together this morning. Help us to grow in grace and the knowledge of you. And may your name be glorified here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, in Matthew chapter 13, last week we saw the sower and the soil. This week we're going to see the sower and the seed, the second parable. I'm going to read this, um, I'm going to read this portion of scripture. So if you have your Bibles open to chapter 13, we're beginning to read at verse 24. Verse 24 says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven. Each one of these parables now, you remember, begin with the phrase, the kingdom of heaven. Well, the first one doesn't begin with that phrase. It ends with it. But all of them have this phrase connected to it. The kingdom of heaven is like unto. And then he expounds what the parable is. So verse 24 says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Jesus loves his own, his own children, and, and he doesn't want to see them hurt. Many churches have wounded Christians. Somebody said that Christians are the uh, unique thing about Christians is they shoot their own wounded, and there's a lot of truth to that. He says, lest you root up the wheat with them, let them both grow together until the harvest. And here is our present day situation in the church of Jesus Christ. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares, bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Well, the disciples did not understand this parable. And we are fortunate that they didn't because Jesus interprets the parable for them. And so jumping over in this chapter um, to verse 37, here's Jesus interpreting this parable. He answered and said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is the son of man. So Jesus is the sower. Verse 38, the field is the world. You know, the Bible says that for God so loved the world. Well, the field here is the world. Then he says, the good seed are the children of the kingdom. In the first parable, the good seed was the, or I'm sorry, the seed in the first parable was the word of God. In the second parable, the seed here is the children of the kingdom. But then he says, the tares are the children of the wicked one. That's Satan. Verse 39, the enemy that sowed them is the devil. 
And the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. So we see the first parable was about the professing church in the first century. The second parable is about the professing church in the second and third centuries. The first parable uh, about the sower and the soil, it kicks in starting with Acts 8. The first seven chapters of Acts is the kingdom still being offered to Israel. Check out Acts chapter 3, verse 19 through 21. You see Peter offering the kingdom. Check out Acts chapter 7 there, the end of it, as Jesus is, uh, St Stephen sees Jesus standing up to return if the Jews will accept him once again, accept the kingdom. This is the final offer of the kingdom in Acts chapter 7, and uh, it's rejected. So the parable of the sower actually kicks in at the start of Acts chapter 8, and it follows Israel's final rejection of the kingdom in Acts chapter 7. Now, last week we saw in the first parable the seed being scattered. We had the word uh, scattered there. And the Greek word spirial means to scatter. And sure enough, in Acts chapter 8, this is where the seed was scattered. The Jewish farmer, you remember, has two methods of planting. One was in hills in a neat little row. I shouldn't say little, but in neat, neat rows in hills. The more popular method was this, using this word here, uh, spiro, which means to scatter or broadcast. And that, remember, we saw the word broadcast was used uh, way before TV and radio came along. It meant to cast in a broad area, casting like this. The seed was scattered. That's the word that the Bible uses here. And when we come to Acts chapter 8, where this first parable kicks in, what do we see? We see persecution against the church, and they were all scattered abroad. And then in the fourth verse, we find out what the, those that were scattered abroad were doing. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. They were broadcasting the word of God. They were scattering the seed. So that's the first, the first parable here. The second parable, which we're going to study today, is what follows up after this. And these parables, these seven parables here, are actually about something we call Christendom. Christendom. Now that, that's not a Bible word, Christendom. But it has come to mean the earthly profession of faith. And c contained within Christendom is true Christianity. And we're going to see in these parables that Christendom far outstrips true Christianity. It becomes a mass movement. And the true Christianity is uh, pretty much hidden within that mass movement. Now, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like unto. He says that seven times. And so he's talking here about something that is like the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is the, is the earthly kingdom over which the Lord Jesus is going to reign. And so Christendom is like the kingdom of heaven. And it's like the kingdom of heaven in six different ways, if you notice on your note sheets. Number one, it's earthly. It's an earthly kingdom. The kingdom of heaven will be when Jesus sits on the throne in Jerusalem, of his the throne of his father David, and rules this world in righteousness and truth and with the rod of iron, the scripture says. It's an earthly kingdom. Christendom, which is the counterfeit kingdom of heaven, is also earthly. Secondly, the kingdom of heaven is going to be a mixture of saved people and lost people. Now that comes as a shock to many people. Many people believe that the earthly kingdom is going to be all saved people. Not so. 
Not true at all. The earthly kingdom is going to be composed of saved and lost people. Now, uh, hold your place in, in Matthew chapter 13 and turn with me to the 20th chapter of the book of Revelation. I want to show you what happens in the earthly kingdom after the thousand years reach their conclusion. Okay, Matthew chapter 20. And in Matthew chapter 20, starting with, I, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 20, uh, starting with verse 7, it says, when the thousand years are expired. So this will be at the end of the millennium, right? Thousand years are expired. Satan, Satan has been bound in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. And look at verse 8. He shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. In other words, the kingdom. Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Satan is going to have so many people willing to follow him at the end of the thousand year millennial kingdom. The world will have experienced a thousand years of peace, a thousand years of prosperity, a thousand years of long lifespan, a thousand years of non-carnivorous animals, a thousand years where the nations beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, a, nation, a, a, a thousand years where they shall study war no more, a thousand years in which there will be a restoration of all things as it was before the flood. Uh, it's going to be a, a paradise on earth, environmentally and so forth. And at the end of the thousand years, Satan is loosed out and it takes him no time at all to get people who the Bible says is as the sand of the sea in number. And verse 9 says, they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and destroyed him. Satan finds a whole multitude of people ready to follow him at the drop of a hat. A thousand years in which there has been no devil to tempt anybody. A thousand years of the greatest uh, time on the face of this earth in history. A thousand years of good government. Wouldn't that be something? Good government. For a thousand years, you can't get any better than that. Jesus is going to be the king. He's going to be ruling things. Okay, so going back to Matthew chapter 13 here, it, the kingdom is going to be a mixture of saved and lost people. Those that will follow Satan at the end of it, obviously, are the lost people. Well, in Matthew chapter 13, if you jump ahead to one of the, uh, one of the parables here, and it's the um, verse 33. This is the parable of the leaven. We'll be dealing with this two weeks from today. Another parable spake he unto them. The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven. Leaven is symbolic of wickedness, corruption, hypocrisy, legalism, a whole bunch of things in the Bible. The Bible interprets leaven five or six different ways. And it says it's the uh, kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal. And what happened? The whole was leavened. The whole thing was leavened. The Bible doesn't teach a great revival in the, at, at the end of the age. Just the opposite teaches a great apostasy at the end of the age. The whole thing is leavened. You can read about it in Revelation chapter 17, the great harlot Babylon, a false world church, a false religious system that, is, that helps to enthrone the Antichrist. Okay, so we have... It, number one, it's earthly. Number two, it's a mixture of saved and lost. Number three, it gives lip service to God. The Pharisees were always ready to give lip service to Jesus before they attack him. Good master, we know that thou speakest the truth in all things and so, so forth, all of that. Christendom gives lip service to the Lord also. Number four, it ends up apostate, as we've seen, Revelation chapter 20 and Matthew 13, 33. Fifthly, true believers are separated from the counterfeit. That's going to happen in the kingdom, at the end of the kingdom, and it's going to happen uh, also here uh, during the tribulation period that follows the kingdom. The church is going to be raptured out before the tribulation period begins, and Christendom is going to go on through the tribulation period and ultimately be destroyed. You can read about that in Revelation chapter 17 also. So the true believers are going to be separated from the counterfeit, and in both cases, there's going to be a harvest in, in the end times. Okay, in the first parable, 
The seed is the word of God. In the second parable, the seed is the children of the kingdom. And in both parables, the seed, or the sower rather, is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what verse 37 says. He that soweth a good seed is the son of man. The parable of the sower on the soil, that's the first parable, gives us a picture of first century Christendom. That's what we looked at last week. Sowing the seed. The seed was good seed. It was the word of God. It fell on four different kinds of soil, only one of which was fruitful. There was nothing wrong with the seed. The trouble was, in three of the four cases, the soil on which the seed fell. But in the second parable, oh, and by, and by the way, we you remember last week, we traced the sowing of the seed right on through the book of Acts, starting with chapter 8 and going right on through. The seed was sown. We saw it falling on good soil, bad soil, and so forth. Well, um, now we're going, in, in the second parable, um, we're going to see uh, the counterfeit seed being sown. In the first parable, the, there was no hypocrisy. The lines between saved and lost were very clear, very definite. And the, in the second parable, which covers the second and third century, first parable is the church in the first century. Second parable, I shouldn't say church, is Christendom in the first century. Se the second parable is Christendom in the second and third centuries. The line between saved and lost begins to become very blurred. Very, very blurred. Christendom in the second and third century had a threefold, you could say a threefold description. Number one, the seed was sown. The seed was sown. Secondly, intense persecution followed. The second and third centuries of church history records the most intense persecution that the church has ever faced. And the true church of Jesus Christ came through in flying colors. Christianity in the teeth of this intense persecution did not shrink. It did not disappear. It expanded. The church persecuted is the church pure. But the church protected is the church polluted. And this was the church persecuted. And they grew and continued to grow. But this is also the church in which the tares were sown. Inside true Christianity, the seeds of Christendom are planted and they grow up in, into the tares. Now, hold your finger there again in Matthew 13 and go with me once again to the book of Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2 and 3 are the seven churches that Jesus writes the book of Revelation to. And these seven churches correspond to the seven parables in Matthew chapter 13. They each cover the same, prophetically cover the same time period. Well, we, we come to the second church. This is the second parable. The second church in Revelation 2 is the church at Smyrna. That starts with verse 8. Revelation chapter 2. And look at verse 9. Jesus said, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. They are of the synagogue of Satan. This is something that existed within the church. And it began way back there in the second and third centuries. We call it today Christendom. Jesus had a different name for it. He calls it the synagogue of Satan. Now, I'll confess to you that for many years, in fact, I'll modify that, many decades, I studied this and wondered, what does it mean when it says, those that say they are Jews and are not? History is full of incidences where Jews have said they were Gentiles to escape persecution. Many, even in Hitler's Germany, there was uh, many, many times that uh, that happened, uh, that they could, a Jew could masquerade as, as a Gentile and escape persecution. But where in history is it the other way around? 
those that say they are Jews but are not. Where is it that Gentiles claim to be Jews? And all of a sudden, God turned the light on. This is talking about Christendom. Christendom pretends to be the kingdom of heaven on earth. Christendom is the counterfeit kingdom of heaven on earth. You take Roman Catholic theology. Rome says, we are, we meaning the Catholic Church, we are the kingdom here on earth. We, we are the kingdom. And we can impose our, we have the right to impose our will on other people and they use different governments to do so. The churches that came out of Rome in the Reformation, they say the same thing, but in a different manner. They say, we are the kingdom of heaven on earth, only it's not a, we're, we're not a political kingdom, it's, it's a spiritual thing. They spiritualize the kingdom. But in both cases, Rome, and Reformation theology teaches that this is the kingdom. Folks, this is not the kingdom. If this is the kingdom, where is Jesus? He's supposed to be on a throne in Jerusalem. If this is the kingdom, why do we still have carnivorous animals? There's not gonna be any during the kingdom. If this is the kingdom, why do we still have war? The Bible says they'll beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. If this is the kingdom, why are not men's lives ex uh, lasting about a thousand years or close to a thousand years, like it says in the book of Isaiah? If this is the king, this is nothing like the kingdom at all. But they say, uh, uh, the Reformation theology teaches, yes, well, it's, it's the kingdom, only it, it's in the spiritual realm. Rome says, oh, it's the kingdom, and it's in the political realm, and, and, and we are it, okay? So anyways, that's, that's the, uh, uh, the first thing is the seed we're sowing. Secondly, intense persecution came along. Still have your Bible open there, or your finger in Revelation chapter 2. Go to Revelation chapter 3. Chapter 3 and verse 9. And Revelation 3, 9, Jesus says it again. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Twice he says this. Within the church is the synagogue of Satan, or as we call it, Christendom. Now Christendom, I believe, is not going to be the final form. I think there's at least one more step of apostasy that is going to set in, and it's already started to set in. You may have heard of it. It goes by the name Chrislam. And it is being propagated by... What's his name, the purpose-driven guy? Uh, Rick Warren and some of his ilk. They're, they're uh, trying to merge teaching of Islam into Christianity. And they're calling it Chrislam. I don't know if it'll ever take root. I don't know if it'll ever go that far or not. But if it does, that'll be another step in, in the apostasy of, of Christendom. Well, three things took place, the seed was sown, intense persecution arose, and thirdly, heretics and apostates sprouted up inside the church. This is the tares that Jesus spoke about here. Now in verse 25, while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Jesus interpreted that for us in verse 39. He says, the enemy that sowed them was the devil. So that enemy there that sowed the bad seed, this is Satan, by, uh, as Jesus tells us here. And it says, while men slept. While men slept, people were asleep. They slept through it. Good men, Christian men, slept through the sowing of the tares in with the wheat. Uh, I read some time ago, I read a, a testimony of a man that came from Nazi Germany, lived all during, uh, through Hitler's uh, time and power over there. And this is what he said. He says, Hitler came for the Jews first, came after the Jews. And he said, he took them, they, they took them off, and many times they disappear in the middle of the night, take them off to concentration camps, murder them and so forth. He says, but I, 
I never said anything, and none of my friends, friends said anything because we weren't Jews. And then he said, after a short while, he says, Hitler came after the gypsies. Hitler hated the gypsies about as bad as he did the Jews. He says he came for the gypsies, he, and he uh, uh, persecuted them and killed them. He said, but we weren't gypsies, so we didn't say anything. And he says it wasn't long after that that Hitler came after the intellectuals, those that on an intellectual basis could, could argue against what he was doing. So he came after the intellectuals. They suddenly just disappeared out of Nazi Germany. And the man said, we didn't say anything about it. We kept silent because we weren't intellectuals. And then he says a short time after that, he came, they came after the clergy. And the clergy began to just suddenly disappear from view. They were taken and arrested and many of them murdered. And he said, we didn't like it, but we didn't say anything because we weren't clergy. And then he said, Hitler came after us. And by the time he came after us, he says, there was nobody left to say anything. While men slept. While men slept. That's when the tares were sown in amongst the weak. First Thessalonians 5, 6 says, Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Verse 26 here in Matthew 13, it says the tares appeared after the wheat appeared. Now, many may wonder, what is a tear? Well, we got a picture of it here. Uh, this is the, the picture of the, of the tear. And um, it has a, uh, a hull right here, a husk. And it looks exactly like the wheat. And in this little husk here, in wheat, the, the grain of wheat is, is inside there. But in the tear, that's hollow, it's empty. It looks just exactly like the wheat, but there's no fruit. The tear can look exactly like Christians, but there's no fruit. It's an empty, hollow husk. And what they have is an empty, hollow profession of faith. Now, the Apostle Paul prophesied that this was going to happen to the church. The Apostle Paul, in the book of Acts, the, the 20th chapter of Acts was written about 60 A.D. Paul only lived another five or six years. They, they murdered him. Okay, he was, he was killed by Rome, by Nero, okay? So this is right near the end of Paul's life in the first century. And here's what he said in verse 29. For I know this, that after my departing, in other words, after I die, shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. He said this is going to happen in the first century. They're going to come in from the outside. But then he said in the very next verse, verse 30, this would be applicable to the second and third century tares. He says, also of your own selves shall men arise speaking verse things to draw away disciples after them. In the first century, the wolves come in from the outside. In the second and third centuries, the tares arose from the inside. Jesus says in verse 38, the field is the world, the good seed is the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one, Satan himself. Jesus said in John 8, 44, to the most religious crowd of his day, he says, ye are of your father, the devil. He's, you, you look that up in John 8, he's talking to a bunch of Pharisees and religious leaders and he says, you are of your father, the devil. He's speaking to a religious crowd here. And he says he was a murderer from the beginning. He's the father of lies. Well, in the second and third centuries, the tares begin to appear within the true church. And the first place they really show up is in Alexandria, Egypt. The church evangelized in the first century planted the seed in Alexandria, Egypt. And the first tear we're going to look at today is a man that lived back then called Clement. He was born in 150 AD. He was raised in a paganistic culture, but professed to be a Christian. And he became a pastor of the church of, in Alexandria, Egypt. He became their pastor. 
Forty years later, in 190 AD, he became the dean of the Bible College in Alexandria. This is the only Bible college that we know of on the African continent at that time. And he believed in seven different plans of salvation. Now this is all under the guidance of, or uh, not the guidance, but under the auspices of being Christian. This is Christendom, or as Jesus said, the synagogue of Satan. Number one, he believed in baptism for the remission of sins. He believed baptism could wash away sin. That was his first, the first plan of salvation he believed in. Secondly, he believed in philosophy, that you could be saved through, through philosophy, approaching the Bible from a philosophical approach. Ignoring Colossians 2.8 that says, Beware let, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. And then thirdly, he believed that you could be saved by overcoming sensuality, in other words, the lust of the flesh. And we have uh, living examples today of how that fails. Look at the Roman Catholic hierarchy, all the pedophile priests and, and so forth, and monks and so forth. That's how, how strong uh, human flesh is, that they can overcome the flesh. You can't do it. Fourthly, he believed in repentance as necessary for salvation. Now, don't, don't misunderstand repentance. Is, uh, the Bible talks about repentance, but uh, repentance by itself, repentance without faith in Jesus Christ, is worthless. Esau, the Bible says, sought no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears, Hebrews 12, 17 tells us. Judas repented after he had betrayed the Lord. He died, and Jesus said it had been better for that man if he had never been born. Repentance without faith in Christ is worthless. Fifthly, he believed in salvation through church membership. Sixthly, he believed in salvation by faith, just a blind faith. Is that you got to you got to believe something, so uh, so to speak. And seventhly, he believed in salvation by works. And going to the next page, he believed that the writings of Plato were inspired by God. He taught that the stars were up there to be worshipped. And probably one of the worst things he ever did, his star pupil was a man by the name of Arjun, who is the second tear that we are going to examine this morning. Now, this was all done within the church and the Bible college in Alexandria, Egypt. And it happened there in the second century. As we come from the second century into the third century, we have this man, Origen. He took over the Alexandrian Bible School of Theology from Clement. And he corrupted both the church, which was already corrupt, and he corrupted the Bible. Origen is one who is credited, probably not the right word, but credited with the corruption of the scriptures that come out of Alexandria, Egypt. He, he wrote something called the Hexpala. And the Hexpala was six columns of the Old Testament, different versions of the Old Testament. In the first column was the true Hebrew scriptures of the Old Testament. In the second column was a Greek translation of the Old Testament. That was called the Septuagint. It, they believe it was, it was translated by 70 Jewish men at, at, uh, around that time. But then the third column was by a man by the name of Aquila, and he believed, or he called God, he had a name for him, Pippa, or Papa, from which the word Pope comes from. And he actually believed that God was a nursing father, a nursing male father. Uh, he was the one that had a lot to do with the changing of Isaiah 7:14 that teaching that it was not a virgin, but just a young woman who was to bear the, the, the Messiah. He was such an apostate, he was kicked out of his own church. But he remained head of, of the, the Bible college there. And he believed that um, in Matthew one twenty three, where it says a virgin shall conceive, he believed that that word virgin was actually not the name, what well, not meaning a virgin, but the name of a blonde German soldier by the name of Panther. Where he got this, I don't know, but he says he was the true father of Jesus. It wasn't God. I mean, this guy's a total rank apostate. Then in the 
fourth column was written by somebody called Symmachus, who rejected Paul's epistles and rejected the gospel of the grace of God. Said, we don't believe that. The fifth was the Septuagint again, only this time it was Origen's translation, and he corrupts it repeatedly. He cor uh, corrupts it. So that was the Hexpola. Not only that, but if you notice in your note sheets, he taught infant baptism. He did not believe in the resurrection, that is a literal resurrection of Christ, bodily resurrection. We have those things today in Christendom, right? Got a whole bunch of professing Christian churches that baptize babies. We have a whole bunch of professing Christian churches, basically Reformation theology churches, that do not believe in a literal resurrection of Jesus Christ. He believed that all people, including demons, would be saved. Many of your liberal churches believe that nobody's going to die and go to hell. He, uh, he taught that the scriptures were worthless if they were taken literally. He spiritualized everything. He had what, they, what we call an allegorical uh, um, uh, pr a presentation of the scriptures. In other words, he said like the whole, the whole Bible is, is kind of like a parable. It, it means something else. Don't take it literally. Well, that's what the liberals do today. It's within the professing church. He believed and taught the existence of purgatory. You think the Catholic Church invented that? Well, he was teaching it before there was a Catholic Church. He added the Apocrypha, uh, at least some of the Apocrypha. He added it to the Bible between the Old and New, and New Testament. Uh, the Catholic Church added all of the Apocrypha back in 1546, but uh, Origen was doing it way back there in the second century. He altered and, corrupt and corrected what he believed were corrections of the New Testament, uh, New Testament uh, uh, manuscripts there. Let me give you an example. In John 1.18, the scripture says, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Origen did not believe that. And so he changed the only begotten son to the only begotten God. So now you got two gods. He believed in two gods, a greater God and a lesser God. And the first God was eternal. This God right here, that was eternal. But the second God was a created. He was the only begotten God. So, so he wasn't eternal. And from that, he derives that Jesus was not, uh, he, he could call Jesus God, but he was not the eternal God. Folks, we have that with us today. It's in Mormonism. It's in Jehovah Witness teaching. It's in some of the liberal churches teaching that Jesus was not really a God. He was a lesser God, or, uh, but he, he's not the only begotten uh, Son of God. And we have some modern day Bible translations that render that verse exactly the same way. No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten God, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. They substitute the word God for the word Son, debunking the deity of Jesus Christ. We have that today. This is Christendom in action. Psalm 89, 34, God says, My covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. 2 Timothy 3.16, 3, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. In his school, there was a man named Arias who first taught that Jesus was not God, and he wrote that the Holy Spirit was not always the Holy Spirit, but he, he evolved into being the Holy Spirit. We have that today. It's called Darwinism or, or evolution. The seeds were all planted back there in the early church. And so um, he, he also taught the pre-existence of the human soul. Mormonism teaches that. The pre, the whole bunch of souls up there in heaven waiting for a body to be born so they can inhabit it. That's Mormonism. This was taught back there in the church. In, in, the first, in the second century. He taught that John the Baptist had been at first an angel before he became a man. This borders on some Mormon teaching as well. They believe a lot of that. And he, he taught transubstantiation. The Catholic Church added transubstantiation to their doctrines in 1215 AD. But, but here was 
Origen teaching it way back there in the second century. He taught that the new birth was entered into by a mystical kiss, whatever that means, and he denied the future millennium as a, and a real hell. He said the kingdom is now, not in the future. Here it is. The kingdom of heaven is like unto the sowing here of the tares in with the, the wheat. We have that being taught today, first by Rome and second in Reformation theology, that this is the kingdom. The kingdom is not a future thousand year reign of Jesus Christ upon this earth, but this is the kingdom today. We have all this stuff in Christendom today. You ask a exponent of the of modern day Bible translations what they think of Origen and they will tell you he was a great Christian man, a true believer and so forth. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Then the third terror is this man named Eusebius. He was a student of Origen and the successor to Origen. He believed that Christ and Constantine, this we're into the third century here now, he believed that Christ and Constantine would rule together throughout eternity. Uh, where, how, how he got that, I don't know. He continued the corruption of scripture that Origen had begun. This was the man that brought the Alexandrian manuscripts of the Bible into Europe. He brought them into Europe, made 50 copies, handwritten copies of the, of the New Testament and brought them into Europe, and this is how they got into the church at Rome. These are, these are Bible manuscripts that nobody ever used except the Roman Catholic Church until the year 1881. The King James Bible is not translated from those Alexandrian manuscripts. Every new translation that is on the market today is based on those Alexandrian manuscripts that come, uh, come out of, uh, from Egypt there. Egypt is a type, a type of the world. In Genesis 28, 26, I mean, the Lord appeared unto him and said, go not down into Egypt. Why? Because Egypt is a type of the world. Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 15, he says, and the Lord will take away from thee all sicknesses and will put none of the evil diseases of Egypt, which thou knowest upon thee. The diseases of Egypt. The diseases of Egypt have infiltrated the church today. It's the world's, uh, the diseases of, of, of the world, the diseases of apostasy entered into the church. Then thirdly, in Isaiah chapter 30 and verse three, therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame and, the, and trust in the shadow of Egypt, your confusion. He says, don't trust in Egypt. Don't put your trust in the world. Egypt is a type of the world, don't trust in the world. And then in Ezekiel 32, 12, he talks about the pomp of Egypt. They shall spoil the pomp of Egypt. Much in Christendom today, especially Romanism, is pomp. All kinds of ceremony and ritual and, and pomp and over. Anybody see the royal wedding <laughs> went over there in England or uh, uh, a few years back, the uh, funeral of Princess Diana, all that pomp that goes on. The Bible says to watch out for the pomp of Egypt, the pomp of the world. In Numbers chapter 11 and verse 5, we remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. They were tired of the manna. And they said, we had all this good food in Egypt. That don't sound so great to me. Cucumbers, melons, and leeks, and onions, and, and garlic. That's what they ate in Egypt. Those things are all tasty, but not a whole real, real, real nutritious. The food of Egypt. In Christendom today, many are feasting on the food of Egypt rather than the word of God. Jeremiah said, thy, uh, he said, thy, uh, uh, Job said, thy words were found and I did eat them. And Jeremiah said that, uh, about, talked about the eating, the eating of the word of God. He said, Jeremiah 15, 16, he says, uh, the word became the joy and rejoicing of his heart. In Acts chapter 7, as Stephen is preaching here, 
It says, to whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts they turned back into Egypt. Talking about Israel in the Old Testament, they didn't turn back into Egypt, but in their hearts they turned back into Egypt. And if Egypt is the world, friends, we have Egypt in the church today. We have Egypt. We got so much of Egypt in the world today. And I blame my generation for allowing it. The Bible says, while men slept, the enemy came and planted the tares. When I was a brand new Christian, which will be 66 years this coming Wednesday, when I was a brand new Christian, boy, you could tell when you walked into a church, you could tell if it was a liberal church or a fundamental church. You could tell if they were preaching the, the, the gospel or if they were just modernistic. You could tell that it was clear. Today that line is, is so bloomed. My generation slept while the tares were being planted. Well, in, in Matthew chapter 13, the tares appear while men slept. And what do we do about it? In verse 28, said, Wilt thou go that we go and gather them up? In verse 29, Jesus said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you root the wheat up with them. And here it is in verse 30, Let both grow together until the harvest, till the time of harvest. Here we are today. Let both grow together until the harvest. The tares are going to be mingled in with the wheat. It's going to be be that way till the end time. Many people say, I don't go to church, this church is full of hypocrites. Of course it is. There's tares in with the wheat. Lots of hypocrites in the church. It never bothers them to go up to VG shopping. There's hypocrites go shopping at VG's, but it doesn't keep them out of it. They don't mind going to the mall where hypocrites shop, that doesn't bother them. <laughs> but go to church, oh, there's hypocrites in the church. But don't look surprised. Jesus said there would be. He said the tares are going to there. Let them both grow together until the harvest. Well, we'll stop here. Next week we go to the third parable, the parable of the mustard seed, as we see the counterfeit kingdom of heaven uh, shaping up uh, down through the centuries. Let's pray together and we'll be dismissed. Now, our Heavenly Father, we pray that you would bless this time. May we feed upon the word of God and might we stand for something. Might we stand for you. Might we stand clad in the whole armor of God that we may resist and fight against the wiles of the devil. Use this, Lord, to your honor and to your glory. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've done and worked through us and help our lives to shine for Christ and to count for Christ in these days in which we are living. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You are dismissed.